السلام علیکم آئی ایم ڈاکٹر مطیع اللہ خان آئی ایم کنسلٹنٹ اینڈوکرونالوجسٹ ایٹ شفا انٹرنیشنل ہاسپٹل اینڈ اسسٹنٹ پروفیسر اینڈوکرونالوجی ایٹ شفا کالج آف میڈیسن ٹوڈے دا ٹاپک آف ڈسکشن از ڈائبٹیز میلائٹس وی ول بی گوئنگ تھرو دا اوور ویو اینڈ دین دا پیتھو فزیولوجی اینڈ آلسو ہاؤ ٹو ڈائگنوز اینڈ ہاؤ ٹو ٹریٹ ڈائبٹیز میلائٹس سو ڈائبٹیز میلائٹس دا ورڈ از بیسیکلی اوریجنیٹنگ فروم ٹو ڈفرنٹ ورڈس ڈائبنن Uh, which basically means to pass through or a siphon and melitis which means like honey when put together both of these words is basically means sweet urine so it is to the old days when people used to uh, taste the urine and it was sweet and uh, they used to diagnose diabetes melitis so the classification of diabetes has been uh, evolving but at this moment of time when uh, we are talking about the uh, ada guidelines that uh, classification is basically type 1 type 2 gestational and secondary to other causes so type 1 diabetes is due to autoimmune beta cell destruction uh, which is due to uh, absolute insulin deficiency and the patient needs insulin from day 1 type 2 diabetes is progressive loss of adequate beta cell uh, insulin secretion frequently on background of insulin resistance so the patient has insulin resistance and initially the patient will be treated with uh, oral medications but at uh, at some point of time the patient may need insulin in type 2 as well so gestational diabetes is a temporary diabetes and basically it is diagnosed in the second or third trimester and it is not present prior to pregnancy diabetes due to other causes can be due to a monogenic diabetes uh, modi or can be due to exocrine pancreatic dysfunctions like cystic fibrosis fibrocalculus uh, pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis so some drugs some chemicals like glucocorticoid or the treatment of hiv and it can also be post transplant diabetes but the two most important are type 1 and type 2 and among them 90% of the spectrum is due to type 2 diabetes so we will be talk, talk talking mainly of type 2 diabetes the pathophysiology are two parts number one uh, there is beta cell islet cell producing insufficient insulin so they fail to produce insufficient insulin uh, so sufficient insulin so the glucose is normally taken up by the gut too and when it, when it is taken up the glucokinase will result in the phosphate uh, production and that is required for atp production this atp is then uh, required for the closure of atp sensitive uh, potassium channel and due to this potassium will uh, accumulate inside and result in depolarization and this will signal the voltage gated calcium channel to open and that will result in the release of insulin so there is a uh, issue in the production of insulin as well as well as the patient also has insulin resistance that occurs at the level of muscle and fat so insulin is attached to these receptors and they become active normally and this results in transduction and the glut4 production and working of glut4 on these cells of the muscle and fat that will absorb the glucose from the blood when it does not occur this will result in uh, glucose in the blood which is hyperglycemia so this is at the level of muscle and fat which is due to insulin resistance that's uh, basically the most important slide which is the pathophysiology and all the treatment is also uh, can also be understood from this slide so we know that islet beta cell islet alpha cells the alpha cells are um, causing increased glucagon production and beta cell is impaired so there is less insulin production these are the two important mechanisms other than that uh, in the liver there is increased hepatic glucose production and at the level of brain there is neurotransmitter dysfunction there is increased appetite at the level of the muscle there is decrease glucose uptake at the level of the fats it is again uh, resulting in increased lipolysis and reduced glucose uptake so these both we know are the insulin resistance and over here we have the insulin production issue other than that we also now know that there is decrease in cretin effect what in cretin effect is that whatever we eat 
it goes through the GI symptom uh, uh, through the GI system and results in production of glucagon-like peptide. And that glucagon-like peptide results in increased insulin production and decreased glucagon production. But this is somehow lost or there is some resistance to this GLP or incretin effect. And also the last thing is that there is increased glucose reabsorption from the kidney in a diabetic patient. So these are the multiple uh, ways of diabetes pathophysiology, the eight ways. This is the ominous octet. Now we should know that uh, the glucose uh, tolerance deteriorates as the beta cell function declines over time. So it takes many years for the diabetes to develop. Whenever a patient has new diagnosis of diabetes, it means that already 8 to 10 years have passed and there was a period of impaired glucose tolerance pre-diabetes uh, when the patient was not detected. And now at this point of time, the patient has 50% of the beta cell function left and 50% is lost. So we have already lost 50% of beta cell. That's why we have to start the treatment as early as possible. And we have to try to remit this patient from diabetes, reverse the diabetes. So, so this type 2 diabetes, the classical in the classical type 2, it will not, the insulin production will not go to zero, but it may go. And sometimes we just need the basal insulin, the background insulin, along with the oral medications in type 2 diabetes. Now, we should also be knowing about the alternative diabetes subtypes, that is the LADA, gestational diabetes, MODI, and ketosis prone diabetes, and post transplant diabetes mellitus. So, uh, it's very prevalent in Pakistan and uh, worldwide, it is 537 million are now living with diabetes. In Pakistan, 33 million diabetics are there. And Pakistan is now the third highest number of people living with diabetes. And additional uh, 11 million adults in Pakistan have pre-diabetes. And one third does not even know. So, this is about uh, more than one third or around one third, 27%. They don't even know that they have diabetes. They are undiagnosed. So in Pakistan, we say that one in four are diabetics. Usually the symptoms the people ask, but actually uh, the most common presentation of a diabetes will be asymptomatic on screening you diagnose diabetes. So the patient may have no symptoms or may have symptoms which are non-specific and attributable to other uh, causes. But when the blood sugars go to 300s or 350, then the patient develop polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia. So type 1 diabetics are thinner than type 2. Type 2 diabetics are more resistant to decay. So both types have decreased wound healing. So why do we care about diabetes? So diabetes is the most common cause of end-stage renal disease, most common cause of blindness, most common cause of amputations. And this is an independent risk factor for CVD. And we also call it the cardiovascular equivalent. So when a patient has diabetes, it's like the patient had an MI. There's two-time increased risk of MI when a patient only has the diabetes. So... So this, these you can see the stroke, it causes stroke. So there are uh, multiple ways of uh, describing it. We can describe it either causing uh, these microvascular retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, and the macrovascular stroke, MI, heart failure, and then um, all uh, the amputations and diabetic foot ulcers. So... How to screen? The, so the classic symptoms of hyperglycemia and a random blood glucose of more than 200, this is one way of diagnosis. If the patient does not have the classic symptoms, then HbA1c or fasting glucose or two-hour OGTT. Any two abnormal test results are required from the same sample, two separate tests. So do not delay the second test. You can just do that test uh, from the same sample. So what you can do is you can call the patient in the fasting state and do the fasting glucose and HbA1c. And maybe if the patient is obese and you want to know any other comorbids as well, like fasting lipid profile. So it's a very simple way. The A1c in the pre-diabetes in the pre-diabetes is between 5.7 to 6.4%. And in diabetics, it is either 6.5 or more than that. 
and the fasting glucose is 100 to 125 and uh, in the pre-diabetes and it is more than 1.6 in diabetes. Two hour plasma glucose is again uh, 140 to 199 and it is more than 200 in diabetes. So let's talk about the treatment. The treatment is either insulin or it is either oral. So usually in type 1, we use insulin and in type 2, we use oral, but in type 2, we may also need insulin. This is the basics, metformin. The mechanism is it inhibits hepatic gluconeogenesis, increase the glycolysis, and it also increases the peripheral glucose uptake. So there, therefore, it is decreasing the insulin resistance. So adverse effect is GI, 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 and it may also result in B12 deficiency and lactic acidosis in a patient who has renal insufficiency. So metformin, lactic acidosis, metabolic acidosis. Sulfonylureas increase the release of insulin, and uh, it is basically, again, causing this blockade of the ATP potassium channel that will result in the uh, depolarization and opening of the calcium channel that will release the insulin and it causes hypoglycemia and weight gain. So the second, third generation sulfonylureases are glimepiride, glycolazide, glipizide, glyburide. So miglitinides are the ripaglinide are similar to sulfonylureas. They just have the uh, shorter half-life. DPP-4 inhibitors, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, linagliptin, cetagliptin, sexagliptin, vildagliptin, all of these are the liptins, so the gliptins. They inhibit the DPP-4 enzyme, which basically was about to destroy the GLP-1. So this will potentiate GLP-1. And uh, DPP-4 inhibitor, you uh, should understand that when, whenever we eat something, it results in the production of GLP-1 that will re release insulin and reduce glucagon. But this is inhibited by dipeptidyl peptidase 4 enzyme. And it actually inhibits the enzyme, so it will potentiate the GLP-1. Now, there's another group which is the GLP-1 agonist. We were inhibiting the enzyme that was causing the a destruction of GLP-1. So here we can just directly give GLP-1 agonists. Exenatide was there, then liraglutide, semaglutide, and dulaglutide. So it will potentiate the GLP-1, and GI is the most common side effect. So you can either give GLP-1 or inhibit the enzyme which was about to destroy this GLP-1. So GLP-1 agonist. Tide, Tide, and DPP-4 inhibitor, Liptin, Liptin, Liptin. SGLT2 inhibitors, Canagliflozin, Dapagliflozin, Empagliflozin, Flozin, Flow, Urinary Flow. So this inhibits the sodium glucose trans co-transporter to decrease the reabsorption of glucose in the proximal convoluted tubule. It will result in glucosuria, UTI, genitourinary infection, dehydration. So here you can see the glucose is reabsorbed by the sodium glucose co-transporter. If you inhibit it, it will result in the loss of glucose into the urine. So SGLT2 inhibitors, the flozins, flows in through the urine. Thysolidine dions are pioglitazone. So they bind to the PPAR gamma nuclear factor and it increases the insulin sensitivity. So here were the groups of the diabetes type 2 medications. Now, how to start with? So usually the first choice is metformin. Metformin is available since 1995. So we know that it reduces the hepatic glucose output and may also increase insulin sensitivity. So the dosing, it, we start with the slow dose, uh, slow titration with the low dose and then go up to 2 uh, gram per day maximal effective dose. It has wonderful A1C lowering effect with potential weight loss effect, but no hypoglycemia. And it has good efficacy, metabolic improvement, uh, and it is a cheaper drug. So this is the drug of choice. Uh, if we start from the lower dose and go up, the GI side effect will be minimal. But if we start from the high dose, then the patient obviously will complain of GI symptoms. So in the renal insufficiency, we avoid it because of the lactic acidosis. 
So in the renal patient, you have to know about the creatinine and GFR before starting it. The GFR should be above 45 before initiating. And if the patient is already on metformin, so you can just reduce the dose uh, to half when the patient's GFR is from 30 to 45. But below 35, it's not recommended. And you should also uh, rule out any liver disease or heart failure, acute heart, heart failure. And before intra arterial contrast, you should hold it. What comes after metformin? So there have been uh, many drugs uh, which were basically recently launched. But for the last many years, from 1950s to 2000, there were only one or two drugs. But since 2008, there are many drugs in the market, many groups. So now let's talk about this uh, multiple complex pathophysiologic abnormalities in type 2 and then the drugs acting on these pathophysiologic abnormalities. So number one, you should know that uh, at the level of pancreas, there is decreased pancreatic insulin secretion and increased pancreatic glucose uh, glucagon secretion. So you need a drug that acts on the insulin production or you could just directly give insulin or you can also uh, then see that at the level of the gi there is the decrease in creatine effect in diabetes so you can give a drug which has the incretin effect or which potentiates the incretin effect and what was the incretin effect it was the glp either give glp1 receptor agonist or give a drug that potentiates the glp1 so then but if we talk about the pathophysiologic abnormalities, there is decreased insulin, increased glucagon. This results in increased uh, blood glucose level. There is increased incretin effect in a type 2 diabetes, and this will result in hyperglycemia. In the liver, there is increased glu glucose production, gluconeogenesis, that results in hyperglycemia. At the level of muscles and fats, there is decreased uptake. This results in hyperglycemia. At the level of kidney, there is increased renal glucose excretion. So drugs acts on all these things. So insulin and sulfonylureas will increase the insulin. GLP-1 receptor agonist and DPP-4 will enhance the incretin effect. Metformin will act on the increasing glucose production. And so it will inhibit the uh, glucose production. And it also acts on the peripheral glucose uptake. So there will be increased glucose uptake along with that. TZDs also act as a insulin sensitizers. And then the SGLT2 inhibitor will result in increased renal excretion. So we divide these groups into insulin providers, the incretin enhancers, the insulin sensitizers, and glucose excretors. In here, can, you can see all these groups. There is insulin and the insulin provider sulfonylureas. Then we have the metformin, TZD, DPP4, GLP1 receptor agonist, and SGLT2. So we uh, should know about the insulins are either long-acting glargine, detimer, intermediate-acting NPH, short-acting uh, regular, or we can have rapid-acting Lispro, Aspart, and Glulysine. So A1C, there is no limit on it. It can increase, uh, it can reduce the A1C. So it, uh, the side effect is hypoglycemia and also weight gain. And it is obviously an injection, so fear of injection. Sulfonylureas, uh, second generation is gliburide and then the third generation glimepride and glipclazide. 1 to 1.5% A1C reduction, hypoglycemia is the side effect and weight gain. Metformin reduces A1C by 1 to 1.5%. GI is the most common symptoms, may result in B12 deficiency. TZDs, the pioglitazone, again 1 to 1.5%. Weight gain is the side effect. Edema, heart failure is a contraindication for it. DPP-4 inhibitor, cetagliptin, and uh, these may cause pancreatitis. And uh, if someone has pancreatitis history, we usually avoid it. Usually they are safe. The liraglutide, albiglutide, lixazinatide, dulaglutide, semaglutide, all have the GI side effects. SGLT2 inhibitor, again, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, will result in polyuria and genitourinary infection. Now, we... Uh, Every year we have the American Diabetes Association guidelines and the American Diabetes Association EASD uh, combined guideline. So in that approach, uh, this has been in the uh, this has been uh, reviewed every year, and uh, even the renewed one is again uh, stressing on this thing that the first line is along with the diet and lifestyle uh, modification. 
you have to start with metformin. And then depending on the indicators, whether the patient has a history of ischemic heart disease, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or if the patient has heart failure, if the patient has CKD. So uh, whether the patient does not have any of such uh, kind of uh, uh, issues, but we have a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia. And then if we want to have weight loss, so we divide the groups into these. So metformin is the first drug. And then if the patient has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or high risk for that, so you have to start either GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven CVD benefits, either or start SGLT2 with proven cardiovascular benefits if the GFR is adequate. And if the patient has a EF of uh, less than 45%, which means uh, heart failure, then SGLT2 with proven benefit will be the drug of choice. And if the patient has chronic kidney disease, but a stable CKD, especially albuminuric CKD, then SGLT2 inhibitor is the preferred one and may also add GLP-1 receptor agonist. Then if there is a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia, so any drug, SGLT2, GLP-1, DPP-4, TZD can be used. For weight loss, again, GLP-1 and SGLT2. So here you can see. Now, if uh, um, cost is a ma major issue, then sulfonylureas will be the drug of choice. Although cost is taken into account, it appears to be the last, least important uh, value in our recommendations. But for patients, this may not be the case, especially given the often trivial clinical differences among drugs. So let's move to the insulin. So insulin, we should know that rapid acting, short acting, intermediate and long acting. So the intermediate long acting, uh, uh, so the long acting are glargine, which has, which is peakless and is there for 24 hours. You can inject it at any point of time, whether before meal or after meal, it doesn't matter. And then we have this NPH, which has a peak of about six to seven years after injecting it. Then the regular one, which has a peak of one and a half or one hour after injecting it, and you have to inject it 30 minutes before meal. And we have this rapid acting, the Lispro aspartame glulysine, which is five to 10 minutes before meal. So short acting is regular insulin, humulinar or Actrapid. Rapid acting is Humulog, Novorapid or Epidra. Intermediate is Humulin N or Insulatard. Then we have the long acting that is the glargine, lentis or levimer. And then we also have the pre-mixed insulins, the humulin 70-30, humulog mix 25 or no mix 30. So here you can see whether it is in the pre-filled or it is in the pen-filled cartridges or uh, again pre-filled pen-filled cartridges or it is in the form of syringe. So it's all about the timing. So rapid acting, short acting, long acting, all these. So let's start with the case, 62-year-old man, type 2 diabetes, suboptimally controlled for 10 years, recently very poorly controlled A1C of 10%. He has well-controlled hypertension and there is no history of CAD. BMI is 30. Advised to have a TERP for severe BPH. Urologist states diabetes need to be better controlled. Current diabetes regimen is metformin, 1 gram BID and glipizide. Presence with BID. Uh, glucose is fasting of 160 to 225 in bedtime. So the sugars are not that good. And patient goal one is I want to have surgery in the next three months and I want to control my diabetes with simplest regimen for as. So we have to start with the basal insulin in such patient. And the basal insulin should be started with 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg and titrate on the self-monitored fasting glucose increased by 2 to units every three days until the fasting is less than 130 or in the range, which is the 80 to 130. And then once uh, you are on the goal of uh, A1C, uh, you also may need to add the mealtime insulin if the postprandial is above. So you can start with the four to six unit of mealtime insulin. And you may also uh, go to pre-mixed insulin in someone who does not want uh, multiple uh, mealtime injections with basal, so you may go to premix twice daily insulin. So in this patient, glargine was started and titrated, and now the glucose have improved. Surgery goes well. So 62-year-old man, type 2 diabetes, suboptimally controlled for 10 years, very poorly controlled A1C, 
10% से इंप्रूव हुआ 7.4 आफ्टर इनिशिएटिंग बेजल इंसुलिन नाउ इज फास्टिंग इज ओके प्री डिनर इज ओके बीएमआई इज 31 ही हैज गेंड 3 टू 4 केजी एंड इन एडिशन टू रीइंफोर्सिंग डाइट एंड प्रोवाइडिंग गाइडेंस ऑन इंक्रीजिंग एक्टिविटी व्हिच आर फॉलोइंग ट्रीटमेंट अप्रोचेस विल अलाउ फॉर बोथ ड्यूरेबल ग्लाइसेमिक कंट्रोल एंड इदर प्रिवेंट वेट गेन और प्रमोट वेट लॉस सो व्हाट शुड बी द ऑप्शन सो वी कैन ऐड सीमा ग्लूटाइड taper glipizide to uh, off and continue basal insulin and metformin that's one way and replace insulin with liraglutide continue glipizide and metformin so both are correct and then we also should know what is the basal bolus corrects the insulin regimen so this is the simplest insulin regimen in which we start with the total daily dose which is about 0.4 to 0.5 units per kg per day and then divide it into basal and bolus so the basal 50% and the bolus is divided by 3 thank you so much